Good tide from crispy Honolulu, Hawaii. This is Think Tech Hawaii, April 25th, 2022. And I am Howard Wig, Hawaii State Energy Office. Welcome to you all. And you, our devoted audience, know that Hawaii is leading the whole nation in the provision of solar panels and we are way, way out ahead in many ways in energy efficiency. But how about a third alternative to hopefully one day reversing the trend of global warming and reversing the steady increase in CO2 carbon dioxide by gobbling that stuff up? And not only that, but making good use of it treating it as another natural resource. That's what we're going to be talking about to Christy Gamble, the Senior Director of Sustainability for Carbon Cure. And she's going to tell you all about what Carbon Cure is. But let me say that if, again, we make use of that CO2, what a concept. And it turns out that the Hawaii Masonry Institute, which represents all three concrete making companies on Oahu, they are fully on board with this program. And they are the movers and shakers. And Christy works with all three of them. So Christy Gamble, and where are you in Canada, Christy, at the moment? <laughs> Well, hi, Howard. I am in Regina, Saskatchewan. So in the prairies where, unlike in Hawaii, we still have snow on the ground. Oh, my goodness. Well, we're still pretty cool here. It's uh, noon and it's just uh, 81 and it'll get maybe up to 84 today and then start dipping back down into the very low 70s. So feel Howard, kind of you're me. <laughs> <laughs> So welcome, welcome, Christy. Thank you for joining us all the way from uh, Canada and we it's a nice sunny day out there occasional drifting clouds trade winds cooling us down so on that cheery note please tell us Christy what in the world is carbon cure a little bit of background and then what you do sure well carbon cure is a Canadian clean technology innovator who is on a mission to reduce the carbon footprint of concrete so our mission as an organization is to reduce 500 million tons of annual carbon emissions by the year 2030. So that's equivalent to taking about 100 million cars off the road. And how we do that is through uh, providing technologies to the concrete industry that allow concrete producers to actually utilize carbon dioxide that has been captured as a material in concrete production. So we're providing a solution that allows uh, the usage of CO2 and the actual permanent capturing and getting rid of CO2. And so it's a really exciting um, innovation in the space of carbon utilization. And it's ultimately a path to the global decarbonization of building materials and construction. Yeah. And Christy, let me ask you, maybe you'll be able to answer this. Of all the CO2 produced worldwide every year, what percentage is taken by the production of concrete? Well, the main ingredient in concrete is cement. So cement is the glue that holds concrete together. And cement production alone accounts for about 7% of the world's CO2 emissions. Yep. So if the cement industry were a country, it would be the third largest country emitter behind China and the United States. Wow. Sounds significant. And taking 100 million cars off the road? That's what's possible through the use of the carbon utilization technologies that uh, Carbon Cure has developed and is in continuing to develop. Mm -hmm. And were, was Carbon Cure an accelerator type startup? Is that how it that worked there? We were, yeah. So we're past the phase now of being in a startup, but that is certainly the origins of our company. Uh, so Carbon Cure itself was founded in 2012, and it was a, it is a technology manufacturer for concrete producers. 
And we have been funded through various grants, venture funding, but also accelerator programs. And in fact, the main reason why we're coming to you today in Hawaii is because of the fact that we were part of the Elemental Accelerator uh, program a couple of years ago. And that program really accelerated our adoption across Hawaii. And as a result, Hawaii is one of the most advanced states for usages of carbon dioxide captured concrete. And you, I think your operations are not confined to little old Hawaii. I think you've got just a few more operations worldwide. That is correct. So as of today, we have over 550 systems sold. So a system is out, we provide a technology to concrete producers. So any operating concrete plant can install our technology to then introduce captured CO2 into their concrete as, as, an, as an admixture, as a material in their concrete. So today there are over 500 plants that are operating and providing concrete made with our technology uh, in many states across the United States, Canada, and then every continent on the globe, except for Antarctica, has at least one representative of carbon cure. So we're actually really starting to get a global reach, which is really exciting because a lot of that global growth really started for us in Hawaii. Even though Hawaii itself might not be international, it was the first step for us to make those international um, growth. Wow. Does Aki Marceau know about this? She, she's the uh, executive director. Aki Marceau. Oh, Aki. oh, yes, of course. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'll have to inform her afterwards that yeah. we're the star coming back, back to Oahu here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the countries that you are in, I believe, is China. Have you made inroads in China yet? Or? Uh, China is actually not one of the uh, countries currently on our operating map. Um, mm -hmm. We are working across Southeast Asia, certain portions. So in particular, Singapore uh, was one of the first international uh, locations to really adopt the use of uh, carbon care. Mm -hmm. Because I believe China is still the, national, the worldwide leader in the consumption of concrete oh. because they do so gosh darn much construction there. Well, absolutely. There's so. a hugely significant amount of construction happening in China, which means that's where the majority of concrete production is made. And so, of course, China is part of our uh, eventual path to decarbonizing the concrete industry. We'll have to get, uh, if we're going to achieve that goal of 500 million tons of CO2 emissions, that will require full-scale adoption across the globe. Wow. And any idea how many cars that will displace? So the 500 million uh, tons of CO2 is the equivalent to taking 100 million cars off the road. Okay. okay. That is a heck of a lot of cars. That's a lot of cars, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why don't you go in more, more into the, uh, the whole pr process and how, how, it, uh, how it works. Absolutely. And the virtues of uh, concretized or carbonized concrete. Sure. Well, first of all, let's just talk about concrete for a minute. So concrete, I, I did mention earlier that concrete through the production of cement accounts for about 7% of the world's CO2 emissions. So it does have a significant carbon footprint attached to it, um, but that is because concrete is the most abundant material on the planet. Uh, it, it, or sorry, the most abundant man-made material on the planet, second most abundant material period after water. So that's incredible. And it makes you wanna think, well, why is concrete so abundant? And that's because it's such a great product. Uh, so one of the things that I really want to highlight is that there are so many sustainable attributes to concrete. If you want to build a construction that is a truly sustainable construction, you need to build it to last. It has to be something that can withstand the elements. And that's really important in the context of climate change where you know, we do see mother nature throwing a lot more forces uh, at our buildings. And so making sure to build to last is a really important part of the sustainability conversation. Then there are other types of uh, conversations as well and strategies to, you know, really reduce the carbon footprint of a building to have a sound infrastructure um, uh, and just overall enclosure. 
So I, I just first of all want to highlight that concrete itself has an impact just because it's such a good material. And so what we need to do as an industry is to uh, deploy more solutions to reduce the carbon impact of cement and concrete so that we can continue within construction to use concrete for all of the good things that it provides, but with less of an impact on overall CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal. Now, talking about carbon cure and where we come in is uh, carbon cures at the forefront of the CO2 utilization industry. We're really rethinking CO2. And so what I mean by rethinking CO2 is that Historically, carbon dioxide, CO2, has always just been a waste byproduct. You know, it is the primary greenhouse gas that is hurting the ozone layer, which is contributing to climate change. And one of the ways to uh, minimize that impact is first and foremost to deploy as many solutions as possible to minimize the actual amount of emissions that are going up in the atmosphere but we also need to find ways to utilize, capture, and then utilize that CO2 for something beneficial. And so that's where we're at the forefront is conceptualizing CO2 is not just this waste byproduct, but it's something that's actually useful. And as it turns out, CO2 is a very useful material for concrete production. So what Carbon Cure does is we manufacture a technology that takes this captured carbon dioxide and we inject it into the concrete as it's being mixed. And what happens is when CO2 is injected into concrete, a chemical reaction occurs right away where that CO2 converts to a mineral. So concrete just happens to have one of the unique properties of being able to convert CO2 into a mineral, a stone. So that means that concrete can actually get rid of CO2 forever because once it's been turned into stone, it's not gonna go back to CO2. It's not going back into the atmosphere. So by introducing the CO2 into the concrete, not only does it turn into a mineral and we, we capture it forever uh, because we've chemically converted it to something else, but what's even more important is that this process will improve the concrete strength. So if you have stronger concrete, that actually allows the concrete producers to use less of the material that gives it its strength, which is cement. So cement also happens to be the most carbon intensive material in concrete. And so if you can use less cement, you're further reducing the carbon footprint of the concrete. So it's a win-win solution where we're able to utilize CO2 to then reduce further CO2 through avoiding um, the use of raw materials that have a high carbon impact. And what about transportation costs? Does that figure in at all? Absolutely. And I assume by cost, you're referring to the CO2 cost of the transportation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's ab absolutely. So by capturing CO2, purifying it, transporting it, that of course generates more CO2 through that whole process. So this is really important from a life cycle accounting to accurately measure and then uh, report the, the actual CO2 footprint. So we do that through our process. We understand the um, life cycle impact. We acknowledge that there are costs involved. The benefits, uh, the amount of CO2 that is captured and reduced far outweigh the costs. So any types of carbon accounts uh, accounting that we report um, are net benefits that have accounted for those costs. And does, do any of the certification, the green certification, organizations uh, re recognize this? Yes, that's a bit of a, um, it, not directly, simply because green certification, so programs like LEED, for example, mm -hmm. uh, LEED does not you know, certify products. What LEED does is it has created a, uh, a platform and a process through which uh, designers can construct to more sustainable standards. So mm -hmm. the use of carbon cure helps designers, building owners to achieve those standards because it lowers the carbon footprint of the building, which is one of the objectives uh, by LEED. So other building, uh, green building programs are usually pretty similar. Most organizations stray away from trying to put a stamp of approval on one product or another, but rather just set a path for decarbonization that uh, our um, product is one uh, solution to help achieve that. 
Very good, because we have already quite a few MEAD certified buildings in, in Hawaii. And it sounds like if they in, include carbonized concrete, they may be able to elevate their lead status a, a bit Absolutely. there. Yeah, yeah. And do you have any applications in Hawaii yet? We do. Uh, so we are very proud to work with three ready mix producers uh, on the island of Oahu. Uh, so the first producer to adopt uh, Carbon Cure was Island Ready Mix. Um, so I, I'd like to give a shout out to Shorty Kuhn if he is watching today. He is retired from Island Ready Mix, but he was uh, uh, the one of the initial people to really take hold of um, Carbon Cure and, and run with it. And uh, of course, say hello to the rest of the Island Ready Mix team for, for joining today. They So we work with Island Ready Mix. We work with... HC and D, and we work with Hawaiian Cement. And so all three producers are partners of Carbon Cure who have been installed the technology and are using it. And this has resulted in quite a few different kinds of construction projects. So one of the first demonstration projects was championed by the Hawaii Department of Transportation. Uh, so Ed Sniffen, who, is, uh, who runs the Hawaiian Department of Transportation is uh, one of the champions for uh, low carbon uh, in, on, in Hawaii. And so because of that, we did a demonstration on the Kapoli uh, interchange um, uh, just outside of Honolulu, sort of in the, in the city limits. And it was one of the first uses of infrastructure, uh, like highway infrastructure, utilizing carbon cure across um, North America, across our footprint. Mm -hmm. So that was really great because it accelerated the use of carbon cure by other departments of transportation in other states across the United States. Yeah, um, very good. And there's just a few states that are slightly bigger than us. So yes. <laughs> presumably they'll be uh, using just a little more uh, concrete than, than uh, little old Hawaii. Well, and generally speaking, government organizations, government entities like departments of transportation are uh, you know, typically slow moving to adopt new innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really great to work with a very energetic and innovative um, Department of Transportation uh, to uh, go through the proper types of validation process. There's a lot of work to validate and verify the use of carbon cure concrete on Hawaii DOT projects. Um, but we were able to do that at you know, a pace that wasn't typical for government organizations. And as a result of it, had a demonstration project that has now led to further use of carbon cure on Hawaii DOT projects. And, you know, it's really important because from the DOT's perspective, they're very aware that there's a lot of construction um, of highways that they're going to have to manage over the next 20 years because some of the highways will be lost to rising sea levels. So it's, you know, it's really hits home when you realize that, um, that rising sea levels is going to remove some of the current infrastructure that exists, they have to rebuild. And so the philosophy of the Hawaiian Department of Transportation is if we're going to have to rebuild, let's make sure we're not contributing to the problem even further by reducing our carbon footprint of this new infrastructure as much as possible. Now, speaking of which we, there are several, uh, beach, a lot of beachfront homes, including here on Oahu and on the North Shore, which gets the heaviest wave impact. Just a couple of months ago, the picture on the front page of the newspaper was a home that was no longer horizontal. It was diagonal. Why was it diagonal? Because it had slipped down onto the wave-worn beach. And then another headline just uh, last week was about a beachfront homeowner who borrowed some heavy uh, equipment, earth moving equipment and shoveled down a whole lot of sand and rubble onto the eroded beach to try to save his property to keep his home from slipping into the sea. So this is a very, very relevant <laughs> topic in Hawaii at, at the moment, yeah. It's, it's heartbreaking to hear about. Then, of course, 
knowing that um, this is just the start of it. And what's also really challenging about it too is that you know this tends to hit um, impact uh, uh, individuals who um, are coming from uh, you know impoverished situations. And so there's certainly an element that becomes very heartbreaking and 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 it's it's very motivating to take, urgent action to address this because it's the hardest hitting populations who are getting hit even harder in many cases. Mm, precisely. We have a question from the audience. Is there any relation between carbonized concrete and the 3D uh, technology where mm. you form objects via, via the, the 3D? I've seen some 3D concrete in action and it's very exciting and very cool. Uh, so no direct relationship. The you know that's uh, an innovation in concrete that allows a new application of the material. Uh, certainly, it's an innovation that could have compatibility. You know, in theory, uh, you could have three D printed concrete that is made with carbon cure. That doesn't exist today, but um, it's uh, it's really exciting because what it does demonstrate is just that there's so much potential for concrete as a material you know concrete is kind of this overlooked material it's something you don't really think about it's you know you're walking on it every day and it's the foundation of your home you don't really pay much attention to it but there's so much that you can do with concrete between sustainability innovations like carbon cure um, but then also you look at these novel types of technology innovations like 3D printing and what that allows for, for creating more affordable homes and different kind of versatility of construction. So it's all very exciting. Uh, yeah. So our, our questioner points out that uh, fashioning the concrete via 3D is a lot less expensive than, than conventional methods. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Uh, it's, uh, we haven't, like I said, we haven't worked with 3D concrete directly, so I, I can't confirm that, but I have heard that that's one of the benefits of it. So I'm really excited to see that technology, um, you know, really expand. And since I'm a historian, I'll throw a, another question at you. What is the oldest existing use of concrete that is still in use today? Well, I think it depends on how you define concrete because uh, there are early pozzolan type of materials. So pozzolan is kind of like an ancient kind of uh, cement. So I'm going to guess that that's probably the Pantheon or something like that in Rome. Um, but I actually think the first use of Portland's cement concrete is in Nova Scotia, believe it or not, in Halifax on a place called George's Island, um, which is not too far from our headquarters. Wow. Well, what I was thinking of was in what's now Lebanon, I believe, uh -huh. which was at, in the time of Christ, if the place was occupied by, by Romans, and they built a harbor there, and the harbor was partially constructed from concrete, and it is in, in use to this day, 2,000 years later. That is very cool. I'm going to have to uh, brush up on some early concrete histories because mm -hmm. that's a really interesting story. Because yeah. we uh, we talk about sustainability, you can't get much more sustainable than that. Absolutely. And um, what about in, in terms of looking at the resilience? Oh, resiliency is a big, big, big uh, factor these days. We talk about not just energy efficient buildings and so forth, so forth. We talk about resilient buildings because we know, speaking just in a way, we know the big one is coming. We're having beautiful, beautiful winter. We're having a beautiful spring, but that ain't gonna last forever. Any resiliency related uh, factors in, in concrete and well, specifically carbonized concrete? Sure, I, I mean, first of all, the use of CO2 has a neutral impact on concrete durability. So there are some properties that are somewhat improved by using CO2 to make more durable concrete, which can improve its resiliency to the um, um, elements. But for the most part, it's, it's neutral. Um, and really, when you talk about resiliency, we have to look at concrete itself as the answer to that question. And to me, a picture speaks a thousand words sometimes of um, now I wish I had this visual up and ready to go. There's a home in Alabama that had been devastated. Uh, the, the entire neighborhood was devastated by a hurricane. 
but this one home was built with concrete specifically for the purpose of being resilient to uh, hurricanes. And while all of the neighborhood has been flattened, this one home is still standing. Mm -hmm. So I think that those kinds of examples, we're seeing some more of that. You know, it's not only hurricanes, it could be tornadoes, uh, the different types of really, you know, really terrible type of weather events to best prepare for them. The best way to do that is to build concrete homes. Another, we've only got a couple of minutes, but another quick quiz. I can't remember when it was, but it was maybe 70, 80, 90 years ago, there was a horrible, horrible earthquake in Tokyo that flattened virtually all the buildings yeah. except one prominent building. What was that? And who was it designed by? Well, was, you're asking me these trick questions here, Howard. You're going to have to answer that one yourself. <laughs> it was a Frank Lloyd Wright building okay. built of... I'm going to guess concrete. Yes. <laughs> Only building left but those standing. Yeah. Well, and, it's, I, you cited an Alabama example. There was a similar example in the Panhandle of uh, Florida, which mm -hmm. is which is nearby. One yeah. building left, concrete. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It just it, Again, it goes all of us. All of us are going to be undergoing, you know, really terrible weather conditions in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it it does go to show that the the best way to uh, protect not only your homes, but the people in the homes, you know, you think about the impact on safety and, and the potential to save lives and how important that is. Um, so, you know, the first answer to being resilient is to build with concrete, but then the second answer as well is to build with the lowest carbon concrete that you can procure because you don't want to, you know, you want to minimize the impact that your construction is having, um, on overall emissions. Mm -hmm. And one final resiliency question, which you can answer, how good does concrete burn in the event of a fire? It's, it's one of the most fire safe materials by far. Uh, so it's, um, you know, there, there are all sorts of different kinds of fire ratings and, and codes that could, you know, address that more specifically depending on different kinds of um, applications. But Ultimately, that's another concept of resiliency right there is that, you know, if obviously if you're going to compare it to a material like wood, it's not going to burn yeah. nearly as fast. <laughs> and just for your benefit and the benefit of our widespread audience, and we, I'm getting indications, we've got a pretty gosh darn good audience out there. Thank right. you, audience. Um, we're in, uh, in the building code world, mm -hmm. we, word resiliency did not occur until about five, six years ago. And now it's all over the place because we know that the big one is coming. And if it's not in the form of a hurricane, it can be in the form of a monster tide due to rising sea levels. And we're already uh, looking at showing up, showing up existing buildings that are within a tsunami zone or a, rise, a monster tide zone. And certainly new construction. Well, that is but, new to the ocean. Yeah, it's got to be just strong as a fortress now. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've been involved in construction sustainability for about a decade now. And the biggest trends that I've seen really hit a lot of steam over the past decade have been resiliency and embodied carbon. So embodied carbon is the carbon footprint of buildings before the lights are turned on for the first time. It's the carbon footprint that comes from the building materials themselves and from the construction. So that's what we're addressing is reducing yeah. embodied yeah. carbon of buildings. But certainly, you know, just this awareness of how urgent it is to build resiliently and also to minimize uh, and eventually eliminate that embodied carbon impact that comes from those buildings. That's what we're after. Is we, we're going to be okay, or at least I'm going to be okay, my generation, but our children, grandchildren, we got to watch out for them and decrease that uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And on that very, very cheery note, I must bid fond adieu. Thank you, Christy Gamble, so much, all coming all the way from Saskatchewan. And thank you to all of our listeners and admirers and viewers, Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii. See you next time.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.